We're recording the interview of Louis Martin. This interview is being conducted by Eric Witte and Adrian Hill from the Wright State University Veterans Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at VFW Post 3280, Huber Heights, Ohio. It is 7 p.m. on August 7th, 2014. <clears throat> okay, so to start off, uh, where and when were you born? Yeah, I was born in Bellevue, Ohio in uh, March of 1934, and Bellevue is located up close to Cedar Point in Sandusky. Okay, uh, 1934. So your parents, uh, what did they do? My father was in World War I. He was a meat cutter in World War I. And my mother was, she wasn't, uh, I don't think she was in the family at that time. She came in later on, and uh, they were married 65 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, and they lived in Tiffin, Ohio, and then migrated into Bellevue, and where he run a butcher shop, meat market. Then he, when the Russian stamps come in, he went into, he sold out on the meat thing and went into a government job making war parts. And uh, the candy factory is where they had the war parts uh, machinery there to make the parts. Because to keep a candy thing in operation, you had to have a government job to go with it. So mm -hmm. they hired machinists and they made different parts for different weapons. At the, and that was also in Bellevue, Ohio. Okay. So that's during World War Two. He... You no, know, this was uh, this is uh, yeah World War Two. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, do you have any siblings? <clears throat> do I have siblings? <laughs> yes, I have uh, two sons and a daughter, and uh, one that one of the oldest son is deceased. Yeah, and the youngest daughter, she is a uh, a captain in the uh, Center of Disease Control. And she has an Indian village in the mountains in North Carolina. And she just completed it 30 years in the service, yeah. In the oh. Center of Disease Control Service. She was in the Air Force at the beginning, yeah. Oh, wow. And that's that's your daughter? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. Our daughter, yeah. Okay. Um, so you said your dad served in the military in World War I. Uh, what branch was he in? Army. He was in the Army? Yeah. Over to Camp Battle Atterbury in Indiana. That's where he went through his training, and that's where he got discharged over there, too. Yeah. Did he deploy to Europe? No. No. He never left Camp Atterbury. Okay. Okay, so let's... Okay, so let's talk about why you joined the Air Force. Um, did... You enlisted, correct? Yeah. Yep. Why did you decide to enlist? Well, I was laying in bed one morning, and my brother, he had already signed up to go, and he said, I think you ought to go with me. And I said, no, I don't think I need to go to service, you know, at this time, you know. But anyway, I got up like a good guy and went with him and uh, went in in uh, October of 1954 and walked out in October of, the first of November of 1974. Wow. Uh, Why would you guys pick the Air Force? Oh, I don't know. He wanted to always go to the Air Force, and I just followed along with him. And he was in jet aircraft, and I was in recip aircraft, yeah. Okay. So, when you, when you, well, the, well you both left at the same time, right? Right, yeah. So, when you guys left for, uh, for basic training, what, what did your parents think? Well, they didn't really know that I was going till the, the time we walked out the door to load up, you know, because we left right from there. We didn't have, we didn't come back home. We went right up to Cleveland, and then from there we we were supposed to go to New York, Samson Field in New York, but they had that flu epidemic and they sent us down to uh, Lackland Air Force Base in uh, Texas. Yeah. What did your parents <laughs> think about? You guys leaving at the same time? Oh, they time. thought it was good. Yeah, they thought it would be good training for us. Yeah, it was. It was very good, yeah. Okay. Um, so did you guys go through basic training together, or did they split you yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. We went through basic training together at Lackland. He slept on the second floor. I slept on the first floor. And uh, also had double-decker beds, you know. 
butt cans on the wall back when they used to be able to smoke. You know. <laughs> we were down there for a grandson that graduated from uh, basic training last year. And man, I tell you what, air conditioned and, you know, really modern, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> what about your instructors in basic training? Do you remember what they were like? Yeah, they were very thorough, yeah. As a matter of fact, they uh, said, if you think you can take us on, come on. You know? <laughs> so, not too many guys went with them, you know. They just did, anybody, did anybody try to take them on? Yeah, yeah, we had two guys, yeah. yeah. Did either of them succeed? I, I don't know what the outcome was, you know, <laughs> but uh, they were all went in a different room. And, yeah, so it was, it was quite interesting waiting, to, waiting for them to come out, you know. Mm -hmm. So the, your introduction to military life, how did you adapt? I think I adapted pretty well, yeah. I didn't have uh, no problems. And I just remember my dad saying, you know, when, he, when we left, he said, listen to what they got to tell you and remember half of it and let the other half go out your other end, you know. So, so that's the way it went right there. Did you, uh, did you think it... <clears throat> Having your brother there with you, your older brother, kind of helped you at all, or did, did you guys ever? You no, know? he always came out on the good end of the stick. Did I he? always was on the other end. You know? <laughs> yeah. Did you guys get to see each other much during basic training? Oh yeah, time? we were right in the same barracks. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, he shipped out from there. Uh, well, we went to tech school. He went to uh, Chinute in Illinois, and I went to Shepherd for reset aircraft in Texas, yeah. And okay. he went to England, and I went to, uh, I went to Newfoundland, yeah. Started, or start, that's when my career started out after training, you know, we went to Newfoundland, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, if you can, just give us kind of a, a brief summary of your time in the Air Force. What, what was your main job? I was, uh, the whole 20 years I was aircraft, and I was reset aircraft except for the last six months uh, at Grissom Air Force Base in Indiana. I was on the KC-135 tankers over there, yeah. I was a flight chief over there. What do you mean by recep aircraft? The propeller-driven aircraft, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, so you were, you were air crew on the aircraft? You actually flew yeah, on the planes? Yeah. Okay. When I first started out, I was a mechanic, yeah. Okay. Ground mechanic, and then I flew, I got up to get on flying status. We paid $100 more a month, so it was good for the family too, you know. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so again, you were in from 1954 to 1974. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 20 years and 11 days. <laughs> you had to wait till the first day of the next month before you could get out. <laughs> so you they got 11 more days out of you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so okay, so after boot camp, you went to the the training to be a mechanic on propeller aircraft. Yeah, right. Uh, and then they sent you to Newfoundland. Yeah, went to uh, Harmon Field in Newfoundland. Yeah. Okay. And then we went TDY to uh, Sanderstrom in uh, in. Uh, New in Greenland, yeah, and then we went to Thule, Greenland, which is as far north as you could go mm -hmm. at Thule, Greenland, and I come back, <clears throat> we were up there around, I don't know, seven or eight months, and we come back into uh, Harmon Field, and then I come rotated back to the States after that, yeah. Okay. Um, were you married yet when you were? No. Okay. no. I didn't get married till we got to Shepherd, or to uh, uh, Brooksfield in Texas, yeah. So you, uh, you were a single guy in the nightlife of Greenland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only place in the world where you had to wear a necktie to go see the movie, you know. Okay. Um, so how long were you on ground, clue, on ground crews before you switched over to flight mechanic? I think six months, yeah. About six months. Take a short break. Um, so you came back to the States, and what did you do then? I was, I, I got on the crew, the flying crew, when I got to Brooksfield in, in Texas, yeah. I got on the flying crew, and uh, 
spend the rest of my time from different assignments, you know. And really, I only had a couple of assignments because I left Brooksfield and we went to Randolph Field. And from Randolph, I went to Vietnam, come back from Vietnam, and uh, <clears throat> to Wright Pat. Wright Pat went to Germany. Germany come back to Norton in California. And from Norton, California, went to Guangzhou, Korea. Come back from Guangzhou, Korea, in uh, to uh, Grissom Air Force Base in Indiana. <clears throat> that terminated my service career. Yeah. Oh wow! That's actually a, a surprising few number of assignments for twenty years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got one assignment with the family in twenty years. Yeah. All of them, the rest of them are on remote stuff, you know. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about the time uh, from the the mid '50s before you went to Vietnam. What what were the missions like? What did you do? Well, we flew for the Fourth Army. We hauled all Fourth Army personnel. We hauled a lot of people out to Almogardo in New Mexico for the bomb drops. And, and uh, mostly uh, was hauling passengers around, and uh, we hauled uh, the vice president of the United States. Uh, okay, I, I want to go back over that in a minute where we don't have the background noise because that's really good stuff. Um, so we'll edit all that out again. Um, so again, what, what kind of missions did you have? Yeah, well, as I say, we supported the 4th Army. It, it was stationed at Fort Sam Houston. We were stationed at Brooksfield and then at Randolph Field. Mm -hmm. and we hauled uh, the general, you know, he'd go out and make all these inspections, Fort Hood, and all the way out to El Paso, in Louisiana. <clears throat> Oh, just about anywhere in the states that they want to go. We didn't go out of the country, mm -hmm. and uh, we hauled many, many dignitaries. And uh, one night during the night, uh, Lyndon wanted to go back to Washington, and uh, just so happened there was a little knoll not too far from the ranch where we had to land. But his airplane that was coming to get him crashed, so we went and and picked him up and took him back to Washington. And we made uh, probably four or five other trips up to the ranch and picked him up and took him back to Washington. You know, wow. so. And you're talking about Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon yeah. Johnson, vice president. In so it was when he was the vice president still. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the dignitary from Conrad Eisenhower come from uh, Germany. And we spent about a week hauling him around throughout the whole area of the United States here. Yeah, so. Wow. It was a pretty nice job. It was pretty plush. Yeah. Nice. We had nice airplanes and good crews to help us out. You know. So, so these would be closer to um, to like a commercial airplane. Yeah, they were called VIP airplanes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. they were fin nicely finished inside. You know, we had a bunk in there. You know, and then like we take Lyndon back to I should call him vice president. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we take him back, and we had a bunk on there. He could get in and sack out while we were en route to back to Washington. And they fed him on the airplane, they fed him good on the airplane, you know. He was a, a beans and pork uh, in a little can, you know, and uh, he liked that. And he went with the lid bent over and a plastic spoon in it, you know. So he, you guys had a, a galley on the plane and could, oh, yeah, could serve yeah. food? Yeah, we could cook anything you wanted on the airplane. And know? he asked for pork and beans? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and them little cans and little, I don't know how many ounces they were, but just bend the lid back and stick a spoon in there, you know. But, but he had other meals too, you know, when we were going somewhere else, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, did you ever get a chance to talk to him? Did he? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was very cordial as far as information. You want to know anything, and he'd feel very good to let you know what was going on. And, he didn't like to be interrupted though. When he went to bed, he didn't want to be interrupted. There's in a couple of cases when it went too, uh, too, <laughs> too pl or plight, you know, the way it went off. Mm -hmm. but, but we made it anyway, you know. So. Nice. Um, you had mentioned you flew uh, people into bomb tests. 
Yeah, yeah, out in Amagardo in uh, New Mexico, yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you ever present when they were doing bomb tests, or? Well, we usually just took the people out there and waited for them to come back. We might sit there four or five hours, you know, waiting for them to come back to get on the airplane to go back, you know, so. So how, were you guys aware at all of, of what was going on there? Oh yeah, we were briefed what was go what they were going out there for and mm -hmm. everything. But, uh, I guess for the amount of distance we were away from it, there wasn't too much to worry about. So we think. I imagine you guys got uh, special security clearance? Yeah, we all had top secret clearance, yeah. So in case they were discussing something on the airplane, you know, uh, you weren't supposed to divulge it, you know, and let it go anywhere else. <clears throat> interesting. Um, any other interesting missions that you went on during that time? Oh, yeah, I guess uh, when, uh, when I was in Germany, Station in Germany, I was doing the same thing there, and we had uh, VC 131s, you know, which is a prop driven airplane, too. And we made a lot of nice flights all through Europe, you know, down to Italy and Spain and Portugal, and, and all, a lot of dignitaries around, you know, different areas. You know, so. When were you in Germany? 67 to 70, I think, no, yeah, right after I come back from Vietnam, 65, 66 in, in Vietnam, and then we went to Germany for three years, yes, yeah. so I think it was 67 to 70, something like that, yeah. So after the blockade of Berlin, you weren't, you weren't yeah, there Yeah, my for that. family, I had a top secret clearance and I couldn't go, but uh, we went on the train, we rode the train up to uh, Berlin. Mm -hmm which was also a Tempelhof airplane where we had a courier go there every day to Tempelhof in, in, uh, in Germany there. And uh, my family got to go to the other side of uh, in the East Berlin area, yeah. They said it was very morbid, you know, there was no, no big life going on, you know, like over in West Berlin, you know, it was a daily thing, everybody moving around doing what they wanted to do. You know, so. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. So the Air Force wouldn't let you go? Not with the clearance that I had, no. No, not with the clearance that I had, yeah. I'm curious, were they afraid that you'd well, get interrogated? Well, I, I guess or? maybe they thought if they knew what you had, they could pick you off, you know, or, you know, hold you back and say, I don't know. I really don't know what the, hmm. what the big reason was for that, you know. Okay, so you said you were you went to Vietnam in '65. Yeah. Where uh, where did you fly out of? We, well, we started out at Tonsonu, which everybody cleared in through the Tonsonu, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we went to the Trang, which is down on the ocean. And we uh, that was our home base the rest of the time we were there for the 13 months that we were there. Yeah. And then we flew all over Vietnam from the south and all the way up to the north end of uh, Vietnam and over to the Laos border and out to the ocean again back home, you know. And uh, we how, we did all kind of, we did troops, we did uh, paratroopers, uh, hauled a lot of uh, deceased people back, you know, soldiers and so-and-so, you know, and KIAs, you know, killed in action, you know. A lot of, you know. Where were you picking them up at, at forward air bases? Yeah, for, uh, forward, uh, forward air bases or air, airstrips that was built in uh, on the, uh, on the uh, Vietnam area, you know. And we had a lot of remote strips, you know, where you just go in and unload and pick up or go and go, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then after you, you picked up the deceased, where did you take them? Brought them back to town Sanute where they were recovered by the medics and taken to the holding area to be shipped back to the States, yeah. yeah. Uh, did you guys have any, any special procedures for dealing? Yeah, yeah, they were all always put in the, in the front of the airplane, you know, in the forward part of the airplane. You didn't put them in the back, you know. And they were coffin or uh, bags, and most of them was in, you know, bags, you know. Yeah, they were held with high respect, yeah. 
Very good, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, did you guys load and unload, or did they have like Graves registration people? Or well, what? when we were at the forward bases, we loaded a lot of them. You know, we had to load a lot of them when we were at forward bases. But it was always in a dignified manner. You just didn't go grab them and put them on board. You know, <laughs> everything, everybody was carried on. You know, so yeah, it was very nice. Yeah. So I'm curious, what did what did that feel like? Well, it made you feel that you were alive, I know that. But, uh, yeah, you had, to, you had to have a lot of feelings for, like if the guy was married and he got back home, and, or when they brought him back, and, you know, the family had to be grieving, you know, that's for sure, you know. There was a lot of people killed in, in Vietnam, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, what other kind of missions did you do in Vietnam? Well, we hauled, we did flares at night, you know, I don't, they, they were, had a tube and they had a magnesium in them and they had a parachute attached to them and you set the elevation that you wanted the flare to go off at, you know, say a thousand feet, 800 feet, 400 feet, or depend kind of what terrain you was in, you know. And then these things that after they went out, they'd explode, and then this parachute would open up and let it float to the ground. And it all depend what altitude you drop is how much light they had, how many cannon powers of light that they had, and it was support to ground troops. You know, that was out there. Maybe they were in a in a gunfight, you know, or a battle or something like that. And you, and it helped them out. You know, they could seem to help it and where they were going. You know. Mm -hmm. Did you guys have radio contact with the troops on the yeah, ground? Yeah, we used a, a Prick 10. It's a radio that they had, and uh, always had a Vietnamese interpreter with you when you went on these missions, in case they, oh, yeah, they could, nobody on the ground could transmit to you, and the, the Vietnamese guy would get on the radio and talk to the interpreter on the airplane, you know, to tell them if they want over here or over there, or wherever we need to move, you know. So. Well, that's. That's right. In 1965, it's not like the Vietnam that you see in movies. What was what was the fighting like? Was it mostly Arvin troops, or? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we had our own troops there too, you know, because you had uh, EOD people, you had uh, artillery people, you had tank people, you had uh, convoy drivers, and you know, there's a whole wide variety of people throughout the. The mission that they were on the ground for, you know. Yeah. So you guys, you had radio contact, so you could hear the the chatter going back and forth. Oh, you yeah. could hear yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned something about paratroopers. Yeah, we the paratroopers would needed time to get their money, you know, for the month, you know, not just because they wanted the money. But they also, we'd take them out and drop them if it was a, a battle going on and they needed support. And we'd haul them out and drop them off. And so they'd actually do jumps out of your aircraft? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. They had to do uh, one a month at least, you know, but they usually got more than that because they were called upon to come out and help at a physical location, you know. So. Were they Green Berets or? Yeah, they were the 101st, I think, 101st Airborne, 101st. yeah. And there was a lot, we hauled a lot of Green Beret, too, yeah. Green Berets was in there, yeah. As a matter of fact, they were pretty young at that time. The Green Beret was pretty young, you know, yeah. an outfit pretty young, yeah. Um, did you guys ever take fire? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Especially on on descent and, and takeoff field. You usually get some good fire, you know, and they would fire at you at night. You could tell because every fifth every fifth round was a tracer, you know, and it come up as red, you know. And the rest of them would maybe be uh, lighter, light blue, you know, and uh, you could tell when you if it got too close to you, you'd just move up in elevation, you know, try to keep ahead of them. Yeah, yeah, we'd take quite a few shots, yeah. Huh. Um, mostly anti-aircraft guns or any surface-to-air missiles? I don't know about surface-to-air missiles. I don't know if we had any of them come close to us or not, you know. Um, did your plane ever get hit? 
Yeah, yeah, we got hit quite a few times, yeah. Matter of fact, we had an engine knocked out one night while we were out there in a, in a, uh, doing flares, so we had to come back in and we didn't have a very good landing. And uh, uh, that's about the size of that. I was with two of them that we had mishap on landings, you know. So, But everybody walked away from it, so it was a good landing, you know. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious, you know, the pilots know what's going on. Did, how much did you know how much trouble did you know how much trouble you were in? Oh yeah, yeah, you could yeah, they would brief you, yeah. You know, they brief you that we're taking fire and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Be ready, you know, in case you had to everybody had a parachute, you know. <laughs> But usually in, in a terrain like that, I don't know if you want to jump out or not. I think it'd be best just try to ride it down. You know? uh, We've lost some crews, yeah. We lost crews over there, yeah. Any, anybody you were close to? or? Oh, yeah. You were all close together, you know, because you all lived in the same compound. And, and uh, I think there was... Uh, 125 or 135 guys in our compound, you know, so. Um, oh, you had said something earlier about dropping off livestock. Oh, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, we'd haul uh, cattle, you know, like beef and stuff like that. And they had a big crate that they put them in, and you, when you put them in there, they put a, uh, a blanket like a cut canvas underneath them and pull them up just where their feet was touching the bottom of the cage, you know. Mm -hmm. So when the cage hit the ground, it didn't break their legs, because it broke their legs, they might as well shoot them or kill them right there, you know. So this way they could move them where they want to. We also hauled fish and chickens, and the fish come in big wicker baskets made with palm leaves and stuff like that, and then they'd put water in there, and these fish are probably this long, you know. And, uh, live fish. Live fish, yeah, yeah, live fish, and they, you could see them swimming around, in there, and they had a cover on top of them, and they were weaved in and closed up, you know. But and then we hauled the chickens too, you know. <laughs> chickens was in crates, and uh, they didn't they didn't get their feet up, and they, they they just was in the crate, you know. That's all, and they didn't fly very good. Because we tried it a couple of times, see how they acted. <laughs> Put a couple out in the old hand, they, they weren't good flyers. <laughs> oh. But you had to have some excitement while you were yeah. there. <laughs> um, who were you taking the, the livestock to? Well, we were taking them to Vietnamese and mountain yards. And mountain yard people, they were lived uh, mostly, in, they stayed in one area. They didn't move back and forth much, you know. But the, the Vietnamese army, they moved a lot, you know. Um, so would they just walk to the nearest air base and meet you guys there, or? No, we usually went and picked them up. They had a, they would be at a outpost somewhere. And they, most of them, we just had a, a makeshift runway, you know. You didn't have a big runways like you have here, you know. <laughs> Sometimes at night time you come in, they line vehicles up along the way so you could know where to land, you know. Because the runways weren't lit, you know. And, and you'd have uh, people there in the daytime or at nighttime too, they'd put different colors up, you know, when the runway was hot, you know, meaning that you could receive fire, you know. And, and then when it was all clear, they'd give you white smoke, you know. Or green, yeah, white, red, white, and green. Anyway, so yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, so you'd you'd fly in a, a plane full of livestock into a remote airfield somewhere, and we yeah we we usually pick up pick up the livestock at the home base when you went out, and you would pick them up and take them to where you were, where you were going to drop them. You might drop them out in a big field, you know. You didn't land. You just Take them and drop them off with a parachute on the cage, and just make sure that you was on the front end of the cage and not the back end, because they did have a tendency to unload when they knew that they were going out that back of that airplane. So you had to be ready for that. Yeah, it could be pretty misty back there, you know. 
<laughs> so you, you were you were pushing cows out of the back of your plane yeah. with a parachute. And we could be at the same time put fish and, and chickens out at the same time, you know. Like, how how high up did you drop them from? Oh, usually around eight nine hundred feet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, sometimes lower. It all depends. But you had to have time for the parachute to open. If you didn't, well, you were doing you were defeating the whole purpose. You know? <laughs> Everything would just be balled up. You know, one thing. You know, so. That is. Uh, did you? It's sometimes it's hard to visualize how this would all work. But I I got pictures and I can't find them. I don't know where the hell they're at. Man. Oh, that is. Yeah. Um, so I'm dying to know who had to clean out the plane when you got back to base. Well, usually you turn it over the ground crew, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but it wasn't all that bad, you know. They just bring a fire truck out there and turn her loose, you know. <laughs> First thing you know, it's all cleaned out. <laughs> That's, that is funny. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you were in Vietnam for 13 months, you said? Yeah, yeah. In 1965 to 1969? Yeah. Or 66, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you said after that you went to Germany? Uh, well, I come back to Wright-Patterson from, from, from Vietnam. Oh, come back right. to Wright-Patterson, then went to Germany, yeah. Um, Spent three years in Germany, yeah. What did you do while you were at Wright-Patterson? Uh, we did... Uh, Test support, yeah. Did uh, a lot of photo mapping, stuff like that, and uh, run high tension wires for to, in the mountains to see, instead of having people walk through to look for hot spots in your, in your lines. Well, we had a camera on board, and every time it hit a hot spot, why, well, it would show up on the camera, and everything was marked where you were at, you know. So that was pretty interesting because you had to stay within the contour of the of the line through the mountains, and it was like riding a roller coaster. You know? And then I flew zero gravity here for the uh, for the space outfit, you know, for the people that go. They had they they were called uh, hmm. I'll catch that up with you, but uh, the, any problems is what they were calling. In other words, you'd get going so fast with the airplane and then you'd go over like that. And when you did, well, everybody would go zero G, you know. <clears throat> and then you'd pull out and everybody was back down on the floor again, you know. So, yeah, it was interesting. So for how long would the, would the plane be at uh, zero Gs? Probably uh, 15, 20 seconds. Uh, it wasn't very long, yeah, it wasn't very long, but it was enough to get the feeling, you know. And then we carried some equipment, you know, to see how it held up and it come out of the problem and, yeah. So, <clears throat> so how often did you do that kind of mission? Well, it all depended on what they had ready at the material lab to be tested, you know, right. or how many people they had to go up and, and do the problems, you know, a lot of times they maybe take people just to, uh, I'm sure it was for a mission of some type, but uh, that they went with you and you let them experience the uh, weightlessness you know, that you had there. You know. mm -hmm. It was a pretty particular uh, operation. You had to know what you were doing, you know, while you were up there because you had to feather the engines. When you were in this motion, you had to feather the engines on and off, uh, in and out to, to a prop which is called uh, feathering the prop out, you know, because if you didn't, the oil in the dome of the prop would leave and then you'd have a runaway prop. So oh. you did that to keep the oil going into the engine or to the prop dome to keep the prop dome loaded, you know, yeah. Oh, wow, that's pretty. Yeah, that's... Because you uh, you, your aircraft weren't designed for zero gravity. Well, the right. ones we had here were, yeah. Were okay. Yeah. So that's interesting. So the the astronauts were coming to you guys to train. But yeah, I don't never remember meeting any of them. Uh, yeah. And then they went to 135s, the big jets. You know, mm -hmm. they could get a longer problem in there. You know. So. But so you yourself went through the the zero gravity 
Yeah, we went through it every time, you know, that they, but you were always strapped in because you had a job to do, you know. You uh -huh. sat between the pilot and the co-pilot, and you were up here feathering the engines out and bringing them back in, you know. So you had to be ready to go. I see. It was interesting. Huh. Uh, okay, so... You were at Wright Patterson, and then you went to Germany. And then where? Then I come back to, from Germany. We come to Norton in in California. Yeah. Okay. Uh, had about the same mission we did there. Home people and, and parts. If somebody needed parts somewhere, you might get a mission to go take parts to somebody else. And it was pretty standard, along with the policy, you know. Okay. Um, so at what point in all this did you get married? I got married in 1957, yeah. Okay. 1957, yeah. Had the three children. And had a good life, yeah. A lot of times you had really had a scrimp, but my wife saved, uh, she saved about $10 a month out of that check, and you only got paid once a month, you know. <laughs> and as an enlisted guy, you didn't get a whole bunch of money, man. But you ate a lot of hamburger and a lot of the hamburger helper, you know. Yeah. So did your, your Mac family... Mac and cheese, you know. Uh, you said your family went with you to Germany? Yeah, that's the only assignment that I had the family go to... to uh, with us, yeah, or with me, yeah. yeah. Um, where did they live the rest of the time? Well, they we lived mostly uh, in uh, San Antonio. They, they stayed right there when I went to... Uh, no, they didn't. Oh, when I went to Vietnam, yeah. Is it when I went to Vietnam, they went back home to uh, Fremont, Ohio. That's where she was from, Fremont. I was from Norwalk, Ohio. And uh, they stayed there with, uh, they, we rented a house there, and they stayed there. And, uh, yeah. Um. So, okay, so while you were in Vietnam, uh, your family was back home in Ohio, how did you guys keep in touch? Well, we wrote letters, you know, and uh, when I was in Korea, then we used the Mars system, you know, the telephone, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you had to know how to use that, too, you know, because when you, you were through asking a question, you'd say over, you know, and they'd come back, you know. It was a part, like a party line, really, because you might be... Uh, in Korea, and there might be 10 other people that are patching your messages through as it goes through, you know, back to here, you know. And you could hear people talking, you know, and so they knew what you were talking about, that's for sure, yeah. Huh. It was like a big party line, you know. But it was nice, you got to hear the kids. Now you just take this little camera and set it up in either that or, uh, what's that one where you talk on a t Skype, you know. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, that's the big thing, Skyping, yeah. Um, okay, so you were on an air base in Vietnam. Um, did you feel like it was secure? Oh yeah, we had we had a lot of border people. I mean, perimeter people that yeah were dug in. They were dug in. They were ready to unless they lobbed something into you. You know that was that happened a lot too. You know, the mortars from outside. You know. Yeah, I felt I felt relatively safe. Yeah. Even though they were lobbing mortars into your base. Well, I I really never got lobbed there. We never never did. But now, twenty mile up the road was Ben uh, Benoit. Yeah, and they got lobbed at all the time. Man, they had a lot of fighter airplanes up there. You know, so that was a little more important to get rid of the fighter airplanes than it was the other planes. You know, I'm sure. You know. So, what did you guys do when you weren't on missions? What did you do to entertain yourselves on the base? Well, we didn't have a movie, so you probably what you did to go down to the club, you know. And sometimes you go into town, the town was pretty secure, yeah. It wasn't too bad. You wouldn't mess around there, maybe eat or something like that. Uh, was there a curfew? Were there certain hours you oh, yeah, were allowed? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was 11 o'clock. 
He had to be back in by eleven o'clock. Yeah. Uh, what were the What were the Vietnamese people in the town like? I, they were pretty friendly. I don't know. I never really dealt with any of them. You know, just going to mess around and come on back. You know. Okay. Uh, were there any Vietnamese workers on the base? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They were all supposed to be certified, you know, to be on the base. Mm -hmm. They also cleaned your huts, you know, where you lived, you know. Everybody had one or two of them in the in the hooch, you know. So they'd clean it, mop it out. Okay. Uh, so you were there for thirteen months. So you were over there for the holidays. Yeah, yeah. What were the well, the first part when I, I I was held up up in New Jersey at McGuire because I was waiting for my uh, birth certificate. Yeah, I didn't bring that with me, you know. And it just seemed like it took forever, you know. So I I probably had twenty days longer there than the average guy did at uh, in uh, McGuire. Yeah. Okay. Because waiting, he wouldn't let me go to. I had that birth certificate with me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so, uh, were you were you at McGuire during the holidays, or? Yeah, yeah, but on the first one, yeah, the first one, and then the second one, while we were getting ready to rotate back, yeah. Oh, so okay, so did you know that you did you have a date already for when you were going to return home? Oh yeah, yeah. And it was pretty true to form. I'd say within two, three days of what they were supposed to be out of there. So everybody else was thinking about the holidays, and you were probably just ready to go. Yeah, ready to go on home. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so coming home, how did that feel? It felt wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. We had a guy on the airplane, and his uh, name was Peter Darling. You know. And when the airplane broke down, or no, the, oh, the the roll call was they had a roll call, and, and they got to that guy's name, Peter Darling, you know, and the airplane just exploded, you know. Everybody thought that was great, you know. And then when you broke ground, there was another big hurrah, you know. And you were on your way, you know. So, uh, so. Did they fly you back to a base in the States? Yeah, I come back to uh, McCord in Washington, yeah. Okay. And then found my way back to Ohio. They, that's where they dropped you off, and that's where you started going back to your home, you know, from there, yeah. So, uh, so did you take civilian flights home? Yeah, I did from uh, McCord, yeah. I just went to the civilian airport and got an airplane there and went to... Uh, I come back to yeah, I come back to Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, met my family there. You know, in Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, so when you when you traveled, were you in your uniform? Yeah, yeah. Back then you did. Now you can go about any way they want to. You know. Yeah. Uh, what was the reaction like from the other people on the planes? Did anybody? No, I think the only time we really got treated good is we landed in. Uh, Las Vegas, and I don't know why we just walked up to the desk and uh, and there was a guy there and he said, Will "You guys get signed in." He said, "I'm taking you to dinner, man." And he took I forget the name of the hotel, but man, he took us over there and ordered anything you want on the menu, man. So everybody enjoyed that meal, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't you know like they said Korean veterans, you know, were spit on and all that stuff. Well. I don't know, nobody ever spit on me, but I, I wasn't accepted, you know, I very, I thought very good, you know, compared to now, hell, you come home, you're a real hero when you come home, you know. But, it was a, I volunteered, so, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, so, who all from your family was there to meet you in Cleveland? Oh, yeah, the wife and the kids, yeah. Oh yeah, that was a big, uh, a big hell of blue, you know. Coming home, Daddy's coming home, man. Yeah. How old were your kids then? I think I think Steve was in a 
fourth grade and then uh, second grade and I think kindergarten, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so, um, where were we? we left off, we were in California. Um, yeah, yeah. What did you do after I there, but I, on an irregular basis, you know, just enough to get my time in because I was also a line chief there at the, at the air base, and we had same as old reciprocating airplanes, you know, and uh, just flew missions around, and a lot of them was just to get pilots that were desk pilots to get their time in to keep them current, you know, and do a lot of night flying. And, because they had had so much night time, so much day time, so many night landings, so many day landings, and stuff like that. So, um, so you said you were you were a line chief? Yeah, right. Yeah, what, what were your responsibilities well, like? Well, I, I was responsible for the airplanes that we had in our squadron. You know? I don't even remember the name of the squadron, the number of the squadron. Right now, but, uh, yeah, to make sure they were ready to go when they had to go in for inspections and when they come out of inspections and weight and balance every year you had to weigh them and all that stuff to see if the center of gravity had changed or whatever happened might have happened to it or do an engine change or prop change, wheels, tires, landing gear. Yeah, you were responsible to get all that done, you know. So I had good troops, yeah, I had good troops. I didn't have no problem with my troops, yeah. yeah. Um, so where'd you go after California? Where did we go after we left California? Mm -hmm. I went to Korea. Yeah. To Korea. Yeah. And how long were you in Korea? Thirteen months. Thirteen. Yeah. Uh, what was the mission like in Korea? Well, I was on a, a 121s, a, a, a three-tailed airplane. Did you ever see them? Oh, you nice. ever go out the museum and see? They're called 121s. They were uh, early warning aircraft, you know. And we were on schedule, we were on, on station 24 hours a day, you know. So in other words, when one was landing, the other one was taking off, you know. So the cover, you had coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know. And it was pretty hectic, yeah, because the old airplanes were tired and they break down. And when you did, you had to, you had to prove somebody right out there with them, you know. And, and it was a tight mission where it didn't matter what the weather was, the airplane went. You could go out there and tow it to the, out on the, on the runway, you get it lined up on the runway, and zero visibility. And that's hard to believe that you'd send somebody off in zero visibility. So when they left, you want to make sure that they were safe to, we had a good airplane to go in, you know. Because uh, they either had to go off or they had to come back down, you know. But, there was no landing back at the strip because of zero visibility, you know. So, hmm. um, so were they flying along the DMZ? Pardon? Were, were they flying along the, the border with North Korea? Yeah, or? yeah, somewhere in that area, yeah. yeah. Um, well, see, we went from, from Korea, they assigned us to, to Thailand, you know, which was in Karat, you know, that's our home station was Karat. That's where we did all the borders, you know, the checking for missiles coming in, missiles going out, and stuff like that. Each little operator in the airplane, I think they had nine operators inside each airplane, you know. And oh, wow. he sat there and he had a big scope in front of him and he could see what was going on, you know, as far as incoming, outgoing, and missions, you know, or ammunition, or whatever, missiles. <laughs> Okay. Thailand um, was a nice place, yeah. That was nice, yeah. Didn't have much time off because you were always trying to get something ready to go, you know. So yeah. at, at that time you were more on the ground oh, keeping yeah. the planes I, in the I air. wasn't on flying staffs at all when I was there, no. Oh, okay. Not in there, no. Okay. Um, where to after that? Well, then I come back to uh, Korea and then I come back to Grissom Field, you know, or Grissom Air Force Base in Indiana. And I had 14 months left in the service when I got there. And it was a uh, SAC command, and I never was in SAC till I got there, man. 
It was an altogether different Air Force, you know. Really? What, what okay. was the difference? Well, it, just, it was really a, a regimented outfit. You know, you, every day you had a certain thing you had to do, you know. You had to take a test every Monday morning. You had to take a test of some type, man, on manuals or whatever kind of junk they put out there for you to take a test on, you know. <laughs> Ammo, because you had you carried ammo on the base, you know, and you had bunkers. You had to go out and inventory. And, yeah, so, let's let's take a minute break while sure. Butch is talking. Okay, we're back from our break. Um, again, we're recording the interview of of Louis Martin um, at VFW Post thirty two eighty three in Huber Heights, Ohio. Okay, so. You were talking about the, the differences of being at a SAC base versus the other commands that you had been in. Yeah. Um, do you know why it was different? Well, they had a more strategic mission, you know. They had the big bombers and they had the big refuelers, you know, and they carried the, you know, the B-52s, you know. And then even in Vietnam, when they'd come over and they'd, they'd start bombing, They'd go for miles before they'd get out and run out of uh, bombs, you know, or whatever they were dropping, you know, the, the missiles or whatever, you know. So, yeah, that was a, a very, uh, very stringent outfit to be in, you know. But I thought, you know, like them tests all the time, I always thought that, you know, maybe once a year, but you know, why do you need it every day? Because you see, now they found out that these guys in these missile silos, they weren't doing nothing, you know. They were supposed to be heads up on what's going on, and, and they were getting the answers to the test from other people. When, when I was in there, you didn't get no answers from nobody, I tell you that. <laughs> Either you did it, and if you didn't make it, you one time you, you were out of that, you were officially capable of running that job, you know. Whatever you had to do, yeah. So did you get extra pay for being oh, on a sack? No. In sack? Yeah. No, no, no. You didn't get nothing extra. But headaches. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so why did you decide to get out? Well, I, I, we decided that 20 years was enough, you know. And, uh, and I'd had a couple, you know, like in trips to Vietnam and uh, Greenland and Newfoundland, and I didn't want to go through no more of it. And I probably would have been primed to go back, probably not to Vietnam, but I'd have probably been, because we were already in uh, Iraq at that time, you know, when I got out, you know. So. <laughs> it wasn't no sense sticking around and doing any more, because when I got out, I had a, I had a good job. I worked for Mobile Oil. And, uh, did uh, about a year there, and then I worked at the base laundry and <laughs> for a year, and went to work right back to the VA, and I stayed there for 20 years. Yeah. Okay. And that was a lucrative assignment. I mean, all you had to do was go to work, keep your nose clean, and go home at night time. What did you do at the VA? I was in uh, engineering, and I was in uh, the pink outfit, pink wallpaper, drywall, and graphics. So did you, do you think you got that job because you were a veteran or? Yeah, because I got out of, when I got out and one day the phone rang and I was home and they wanted to know if I, if I wanted to be air police and I said, no, I don't think I want to be air police, you know. Well, how would you like to be a painter? And I said, I wouldn't mind trying that. And so I went there and uh, interviewed with the chief of the engineering division and uh, he asked me, he said, uh, when do you think you could go to work? And I said, well, give me two weeks. I said, I don't want to walk off from the other job, you know. I'd like to have two weeks of time, you know, to get over here, you know. So I did that and did, went on to work. Never uh, never looked back, you know. Okay. Pay was good. You worked at the, the VA in Dayton? Yeah, that's the only one I ever worked at was the one in Dayton. Okay. Um, so you were there over the course of 20 years. Did you notice any changes oh, in yeah. the VA? Oh, yeah. We went from the old hospital to the new hospital, yeah. Mm -hmm. and the old hospital was 
an old, old job, you know, and <laughs> the bunks was lined up, you know, in there, and now you got rooms, everybody's got a room, and, and uh, we didn't have, the old building didn't have air conditioning, had fans. That was a big plus right there, you know. And uh, <clears throat> just, do uh, you know that you can go from the power plant anywhere underground to the, in the VA to a building. Huh. Tunnels go through the whole thing, you know. You guys been in, in Iraq, and uh, you've been probably down the tunnels there. I don't know if they <laughs> had too many of them, but we had one guy come back from Vietnam, and he we were down in the tunnels working, and somebody drove over a manhole cover on top, you know, boy, it rattled like hell, you know. <laughs> I thought he was coming on glue, man. <laughs> uh. So I'm curious. The the VA is a hot topic in the news right now. What do you, what's your opinion of the VA? Well, I've I've of course I worked there, and one time I needed a hearing test, and they sent me all the way to Louisville because they didn't want me to interfere or show any interference here with the system here in in Dayton. Mm -hmm. So that's that shows you one thing that they are looking out for that, and also I've never had a problem on getting an appointment. Not just because I worked there, but uh, I, I, I've seen a lot of people come in and bitch and cuss and raise all kind of hell. But they always went to the wrong person. That little old lady or that guy sat behind that desk, he didn't have nothing to do with what you were raising hell about. He needed to go over here to the desk, the big guy, man. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I never, uh, never felt that I was mistreated in that. Uh, in my operations out there at the VA, yeah. So do you think, do you think working for an organization like the VA made it easier to transition from being in the military to being a civilian? Oh, not necessarily, not necessarily. You probably had more government regulations working there than you did in the, the civilian life, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, so have you stayed in contact with anybody that you were in the service with? Yeah, we still uh, have contact with a couple people in Indiana and California, uh, Washington. Yeah, a lot of them have passed on now. Yeah, a lot of them have passed on. Mostly the guys, you know, the ladies didn't pass it. You know. Matter of fact, the lady just called us the other day and her husband's got uh, Alzheimer's real bad now. She said it's really uh, hard to take care of him, you know. But yeah, he matter of fact, he was a flight steward on on uh, Air Force One for about seven years, man. He was one of the chief cooks on uh, on Air Force One, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, he was in during Lyndon Johnson's area and uh, Nixon. And uh, how far up did he go? Like one of the bushes, I think, and then he retired, you know, he had his time mm -hmm. in to retire, you know. Uh, so, obviously you're a member of the VFW. Um, are you a member of any other veterans organizations? Yeah, I belong to the VFW, I belong to the AMVETS, and I used to belong to the Legion, and uh, what else? DAV, of course, they, they don't have a place to meet, you know. But, mm -hmm. And then I blown the Knights of Columbus, and I used to blow the Eagles, and then they went out of business here, so I never did follow up with them. So why did you decide to join the different veterans organizations? Oh, I don't know. They just had a lot to offer, and uh, I was glad to see the, the turnaround, which I think is coming up now because it got antiquated, you know. And matter of fact, they were killing themselves off, you know. The not do, you know, they they were so regimented and going one way, you know. There was no way but their way, you know. And now that the, some younger guys are coming in, and I'm glad to see. It. I hope you guys are members of the place because mm -hmm. we need new blood, man. It's just like the KSC, you know. The old guys are tired, man. I'm 80 years old. And you know, I'm tired of mowing grass down there, you know. <laughs> Where's the young guys, man? <laughs> if there's a party, they're there. But after that, no cleanup people, you know. 
but yeah, yeah. I just, I just, we, we've always enjoyed it, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, just a couple, couple reflections. Um, how did your experience in the military affect your life? I think the, the tour to Vietnam and uh, the tour to Korea uh, was just 13 months or 26 months wasted, you know, of my life, you know, because I was with my family and I just, you know, was a mission really that much, you know, but I guess it was because we had a war and we had to protect everybody back home, which, which I'm glad to see that I got to put an effort forward to that, which you guys are doing now, you know. But, and thank you for your time in the service, you know. Um, did you learn any lessons while you were in the military? Yeah, be punctual, be neat, and uh, conduct yourself in a, in a fine manner, you know, don't go out there and be drunk and walking around, you know, and want to fight everybody, and you have to be respectable, you know, make yourself a good citizen, you know, wear your uniform proud, too, a lot of people, are, these new uniforms, I hate them, man, because they, they're just sloppy looking things, man, and field jackets they got now, and the pants, you, when I was in, they, that was it, uh, they were hard, man, yeah, they were starched, man, I tell you, <laughs> now there's nothing starched anymore, you know. But that's life now, you know. <laughs> okay, so like I said, this video will be in the libraries for future generations. So this is your chance. Do you have any uh, any message you want to give to the the future generations that hear your story? No, I, I just if they come in service, I have a grandson that just come in. He's in the reserves now, down in. Uh, South Carolina, and uh, he's going to go to school at Emory, Emory Aircraft School in, <clears throat> in Florida. And uh, our daughter, like I say, is in the military, and she's a colonel, and half a lot higher up than I ever got. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I just like, I like to see the, the military hold their own and, and be good citizens along with being in the military and support the schools. And, so your kids can grow up and have good education, and uh, maybe maybe we can cut down on some of the foreigners coming here to take the jobs or take them back home. You know, like I say, the Chinese send them over here, and the first thing you know, they're going back home. You know, and have them a good job back home. You know? But uh, no, be proud, be proud of the United States, man. Now we're we're free. You know, I, uh, it's. Uh, been a long road to hoe, you know, and it's, it's going down, it's going down faster than it went up, you know, that's for sure. I don't think that we got the leadership that we should have right now. You know. Just the other day, they had a general shot, and that was the first one that, in all the wars that we've had up through Afghanistan and that, since uh, uh, Korea, I think, that was the last general that was ever killed in, uh, in this time period, you know. But no, just be proud of your country, you know. And I think you guys are doing a good job by having this uh, interview. And and I, uh, it's factual. I know that. There's no 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 uh, frosting on the cake here, you know. And I like the way you handled yourself. Yeah, yeah it's nice. Okay. Um, is there anything you feel like we've missed, or anything you want to go back over? No, I think uh, I think the coverage was good. I I believe though that interview paperwork should be given to the at least a day or two ahead of time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information, you know. Half-heartedly, I I shouldn't say half-heartedly, but the time I had to, for my wife to write it in there because I have the tremor so bad, and, and uh, it could have been a lot better interview uh, for the paperwork. Mm -hmm. If you had it uh, a, at least a day, you know. Okay. 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 Well, I think that's all we've got. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you much for the interview, and yeah. thank you for you your service. If you need any more information, feel free to let me know, you know. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks.